This morning I'll be reading from Job 38, 1 through 7, and 34 to 41. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, Who is this that the darkness counseled by the words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you shall declare to me, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the heavenly blessings shouted for joy. Can you lift up your voice to the clouds so that a flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightnings so that you may go and say to you, here we are? Who has put wisdom in the inward parts or given understanding to the mind? Who has the wisdom to number the clouds? Or who can tilt the water skins of the heavens when the dust runs into the mass and the clouds cling together? Can you hunt the prey for the lions or satisfy the appetite of the young lions? When, the, when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in their cover, covert? Who provides for the raven in its prey when its young ones cry to God and wander out for the lack of food? second reading comes today from the book of Mark, chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. Hear now the reading of the word. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you, but whoever wishes to be Come great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Let us pray. Loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I believe that one of the greatest gifts that God gives us is that of a brand new human life. Whether we're the parents or the grandparents or even just friends of the family, there's no greater joy than welcoming a new life into our world. Babies are so full of promise, and when we look at a new life, it's easy to see an empty book just waiting to be filled up. What will they become, we wonder? A doctor? A minister? An artist? The possibilities are endless, and it's exciting. But how many times do we wonder if the child will become a bus driver, or a sanitation worker, or a waitress? We don't really allow our thoughts to move in that direction, right? At least not right away. As 
as time goes by, though, and the new life begins to take shape, I think that at some level we begin to eliminate possibilities. A three-year-old who is a sticky, screaming mess does not seem to hold nearly as much potential as the adorable newborn that sleeps most of the time. The six-year-old who has managed to cover himself from head to toe with mud ten minutes before church is, in the moment at least, about as unadorable as you can get. And yeah, we can probably cross minister off of the list of possibilities. So time marches on and our expectations adjust themselves accordingly. And before you know it, we're hoping that the new life, which once held so much promise, will just simply make it to adulthood in one piece. These were some of my thoughts as we served this past Wednesday at the Feeding Friends community meal. Standing there spooning salad for some of the children and being shunned by others who viewed salad as just another variety of grass, I realized that a lot of the children had become familiar faces. I have to admit that as I get to know these kids, I often find myself wondering about their lives wondering how they came to be in that line in the first place, wondering if their needs are being met during the rest of the month when I don't see them. I wonder about the family problems that perhaps compromise the quality of their lives. But then I start to wonder about families all over the country and the systemic injustices that lead to poverty in the first place. By this time, my blood begins to boil as I reflect on the number of children who live in the richest country in the world that are allowed to go to bed hungry. Now I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that everyone here takes this to heart just as much as I do. As followers of Christ, that's what we do. It's our thing. But even as compassionate human beings, I know that this pricks at our consciences and weighs heavily on our hearts. Even so, I want to make us a little more uncomfortable. I want to dig deeper and make this even more personal because until we are willing to look at the ways in which we offer our consent to systemic injustice, we're just spinning our wheels. You see, if we truly want to change, if we truly want a world in which no one goes to bed hungry, if we truly want a world of equal opportunity where everyone is living a fruitful and productive life, then we have to recognize and own that this is a social problem that involves us all. Speaking for myself, I know how easy it is to overlook cultural influences that shape our beliefs and affect our actions. And perhaps that's why today's reading was considered important enough to be included in Mark's gospel. You see, the story is actually a perfect example of how deeply embedded humans become in their culture and how that embeddedness shapes our ideas about what the world looks like. For those following Jesus, the kingdom of God would have looked a lot like the Roman Empire because that was their culture of influence. Despite everything that Jesus had said about God's kingdom that was to the contrary, they were still clinging to the idea that a change in leadership would bring about justice for everyone, and that Jesus was just the guy to make this happen. He was charismatic. He had special power. He was a shaker and a mover that was headed straight to the top. And they wanted to make sure that they went with him. Over and over, Jesus had been telling them, that's not what it looks like. In fact, it's the complete opposite of all of that. If you recall, last week, Jesus had an encounter with a rich man who was having difficulty letting go of his possessions. That encounter happened right before this conversation with the Zebedee brothers. And at the very end of that story, Jesus had told the disciples for perhaps the umpteenth time that the first would be last and the last would be first. But the disciples, 
just could not seem to imagine anything beyond the culture to which they were accustomed. They just did not get that leadership of the empire was not the problem. The problem was the empire itself. They were not able to see that Jesus' entire ministry ran counter to the narrative of empire, that he did not want to reorganize the empire, but rather that he was offering a vision of a whole different world. As we read the story 2,000 years later, the disciples sound ridiculous and completely self-absorbed in their desire to be second in command in this new and improved empire. But what is more difficult to see is that we are just like the Zebedee brothers. We, too, are part of an empire. And we, too, cling to the idea that if leadership would just end up in the right hands, there would be justice for everyone. 2,000 years later, we still believe that if we could just get our legislation right, there would be justice for everyone. That if we advocate and lobby hard enough, there would be justice for everyone. That if we could tweak the system just so, there would be justice for everyone. Like the disciples, we just can't seem to grasp that this is not a top to bottom effort where if we somehow manage to fix the system, then justice will trickle down to everyone. Like the disciples, we are slaves to a system mentality, and we don't even know it. Over and over, Jesus gave examples of what the new world would look like. In the new world, everything is turned inside out and upside down from a system of enslavement to the freedom of servitude. Jesus made it clear that those who come first are not the powerful ones who hold all of are the Jesus made it clear that those who come first are not the powerful ones who hold all of the money and sit at the head of the table while they make up all of the rules for the rest of us. The ones who come first are the ones who wait patiently on the powerful, refilling their wine glasses and serving them their next course. Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all, for the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus' mission was not to fix the system because the system can never serve anyone other than those who are at the top. Jesus' mission was to show us how to serve each other and how to be free from a system that keeps us enslaved and impoverished. And so today, as I think about children all over the world who are going to bed hungry, I would like to challenge all of us to a life of freedom from enslavement through a life of servant leadership. I'm sorry. In his book, From Wild Man to Wise Man, Richard Rohr said, there are two ways of being a prophet. One is to tell the enslaved that they um, can be free, and that's the difficult path of Moses. The second is to tell those who think that they are free that they are enslaved. That is the path of Jesus. Jesus' instructions on servant leadership and true greatness are found throughout all four Gospels. It was clearly a message that the earliest followers and those of us following today need to hear. In our day, as in Jesus's, those who are young, poor, and without power are likely to be trampled in the stampede for the best seats, the most power, the most privilege, the most wealth, and the greatest advantage. The needs of children in America and children all over the world call us to demonstrate our greatness through servant leadership and service. We know that this country can afford to give them what they need. What we cannot afford is to look the other way, hiding from our calling or feeling that we're not equal to the task. In the words of Martin Luther King Jr., everybody can be great because anybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and your verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love. If our children are to be free, then we must
must be free. If we are to enter the kingdom of heaven, then our children must lead us. It is the inside-out reversal of everything that we think we know. It is a subversion of the norm. It is gazing into the face of a newborn and knowing that they must be taught to serve rather than to succeed. And this, my friend, is the true calling of Christ. Amen. Our next hymn this morning is in the binder in your pews, page 28. Please stand as you're able and join as we sing Healing River of the Spirit. <coughs> to invite us to enter into our moment of prayer where we lift up those in our community who are in need of our prayer, those who we love, who are hurting or, or celebrating even. Um, prayer is the most powerful thing that we do together, and I believe with all my heart that when we lift up those we love, they are indeed touched by the Spirit of God. Kayla. I have I have prayers for my great grandpa Lester who's still alive, but he's in the hospital. God, in your grace. This weekend we went up to Stevens Point for Frank's first choir concert, which was great. And we've been up there a bit because I've been getting his tuxedo ready and stuff. And when we left, he said, you guys need to stop coming up so often. My friends are starting to make fun of me. So I think we're successful in his acclimation to school, <laughs> so, which, for which we're very thankful. Um, we also need to lift up the David Neal family. I spoke to Julie this morning, and she said that Dave's dad is not expected to live through today. So they have a hard road. God in your grace. Hear our prayers. At the end of our uh, meeting on last Sunday with Pastor Joanne Thompson uh, from the conference, UCC conference, 
Uh, she said she was very impressed with the leadership of our church. And I'm very thankful for that leadership. God be praised. Hear our prayers. Uh, I would like uh, to send a prayers for someone named Mary who comes to the Wednesday Feeding Friends every Wednesday. Um, I've talked with Mary a lot, and she is very um, apprehensive about getting a pacemaker on Tuesday. She's uh, very frightened, and she asks us to pray for her. So prayers for Mary. God, in your grace, hear our prayers. Joe and I would like to ask you to uh, lift up your prayers for uh, friends, uh, Marsha and Scott Mern. Marsha is a very close friend of Joe's, and Scott is deteriorating due to his cancer and has en entered hospice care. God in your grace. Hear our prayers. You can't uh, believe, I can't believe that I'm going to be saying this, but I spend my time running around all the time, and I think it's time for me to slow down. I was rushing about this morning, and I popped my left knee, and it's really hurting. And I have a dinner tonight. Uh, tonight is the uh, Mexican dinner for the free clinic. And as a commitment, <laughs> I must fulfill. So please, I know God is telling me to slow down <laughs> because I'm like a whirlwind. Uh, the person that was supposed to come and help me cannot. So, but everything is ready. So please pray for me that my knee holds out at least through tonight and tomorrow is another day. God, in your grace. Hear our prayers. I have a few prayer requests today. Uh, the first one is for a dear friend of mine, Susan Clark, who I used to work with. This lady lived her life for Jesus. She was the kindest individual I have ever known in my life. She passed away this last week of a heart attack at the age of 64. So for Susan and her family, I ask for prayers. Also, this past week uh, was um, no bullying week. Uh, and people were to wear purple. I thank Marilyn for wearing hers even though she didn't know it. Uh, but for, the, for all those who have ended their lives because of bullying, I ask for prayers. And then on a good note, uh, from Africa this week, I mentioned in the past that um, after the flooding, they ended up with 48 teenage mothers and their children showed up at the church for assistance because they had lost everything. A group has co now come in they have sent clothing for the children. They have sent medicine for the children. And they are in the process of hooking up with the national office in Africa to set up a free clinic, which is so much needed over there. So God in your grace.
gracious creator. In this moment, we pause and we center ourselves. We still ourselves and we know that you are God. We rest in the depth of your love that exceeds our deepest longings. How grateful we are that there is no where we can go away from your spirit. There is nothing we can do to separate us from your loving presence. This is the faith that we hold on to, even when we don't see your hand or feel you near us. Come to us today with your transforming power and your abundant life. We pray that you will meet each of us at the point of our deepest needs. Open and soften our hearts to receive all that you have for us. Many among us are carrying heavy and challenging burdens, fears, and uncertainties. Dear God, fill us with your love that casts out all fear. Touch us with your comfort that heals our wounds, physical, emotional, and spiritual. Infuse us with your grace that restores our souls and with your joy that renews our hope. You are the source of new and transformed life, new revelations, and new opportunities. Our certainty is in you, and we give you thanks. Our hearts break for your world, dear God, for the violence, the injustice, and the losses. God of mercy, help us to meet the needs of your people everywhere calling us to demonstrate our greatness through servant leadership and service. Empower us to be partners with you in creating a world where justice prevails and where love overcomes. For it is by your grace we accept with joy the life of discipleship, giving to you our help, heartfelt gratitude and thanks. Gracious God, Abba, send us out in the power of your spirit to live and serve to your praise and glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. The Joyful Noise Collection again this morning and next Sunday will be for feeding friends, and um, I just have to report to you that last Wednesday was quite the event. Um, we had um, a visiting church helping us, uh, the Barnabelle Lutheran Church, and they are actually going to try to be <coughs> one of the uh, Wednesday night uh, churches providing uh, the Wednesday night feeding friends. And um, with them being there and an increase in attendance, we fed between 90 and 100 people. The best part of it was that we had a tremendous crew. We had a lot of people that, um, that pitched in. And I am happy to report, I hope, that the Ridgeway Fire Department will get over being called to 3302 County Road H discovering that it was only the billowing smoke from roasting um, uh, frying burgers. And we, we, we fried um, 125, I think, 75% lean hamburgers. <laughs> it was quite a fire. Um, the whole thing reminded me, too, with just a bit of humor, that um, I grew up over in Fenimore and uh, attended, as did my whole extended family, attended 
St. Peter's Lutheran Church, and I had an uncle, my Uncle Dick Brainerd, who was a life insur insurance salesman, and he led everything, and he led committees, and he was an MC, and his closing line to every report in the bulletin was, the committee worked hard, a good time was had by all. <laughs> Please join me in our prayer of dedication. God of love and abundance, may this offering assist us in continuing Christ's work in the world to heal the grief, transgressions, and illnesses that oppress and harm your creation. Amen. Please be seated. Now we come to the table again, mindful of how Jesus laid his life down so that we and creation could be born anew. Mindful of how he took his life up again so that we and creation could be filled with the life abundant. Mindful that we cannot earn or purchase the privilege, but that it is his grace which beckons us and his grace which ensures that all creation may be one and whole. God, be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God. God, may your spirit work in these fruits of earth so that they may become for us a sharing in Christ's body and blood. May your spirit work in we who are children of earth so that we may be transformed into Christ's body, carrying his life, his care, and his salvation to all of creation. Amen. And so we remember that on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus shared his 
last meal with his friends. And he took the bread and he broke it. And he lifted it up and he gave thanks, saying, This is my body that has been broken for you. Eat it and remember me. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup. And as he poured, this is the, the cup of the new covenant poured in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it and remember me. And so we take, we eat. We drink and we remember that there is no greater love than the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Come, for all things have been made ready.
just give thanks. Gracious God, in this moment and this meal, we have remembered that the whole of creation is held in your hand, that the whole of creation is filled with your life, that the whole of creation has been restored by your work, and that the whole of creation is flooded with your spirit. So now we go from this place back into the world to proclaim your saving message in the confidence that comes from knowing Christ's limitless grace, God's infinite love, and the Holy Spirit's rest, relentless companionship always encompasses us and are always with us. Amen. Our hymn of sending this morning is page 431 in your hymnal. Please stand as you're able and join as we sing, Go, my children, with my blessing. <coughs> sustain you.